Andy Warhol was a printmaker. If he printed on canvas, it was a painting. If it was on paper, it's a print. And if you do multiples of them, it's a portfolio of prints. This exhibition is called Andy Warhol, The Portfolios. And it all comes from the collection of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Their Art in the Communities program sends exhibitions all around the world from their enormous holdings. In this case, these are probably the most famous images from the early part of Andy Warhol's career. We're familiar with them as paintings. These are the prints. It comes as a set, very often groups of 10 or 8 related images in different colorways. This very rich collection brings together some of the best, some of the best known, but also some of the less well known of the portfolio prints. Things like the myths, endangered species, 10 great Jews of the 20th century. These are perhaps less familiar to an audience that can recognize a Warhol from 50 paces. Andy Warhol was born in 1928 in Pittsburgh. His mother and father, Andre and Julia Warhola, as they were called, came from Slovakia. They were immigrants. It was a poor family. He had two elder brothers. They struggled. They ate Campbell's soup every lunchtime. There's a hint. And um, he had the talent, but he was also a sickly child. He suffered from St. Vitus's dance, a, a disease of the nervous system, which made him shy and bashful, something that he carried with him all his life. Difficult to make friends, difficult to be intimate with people. However, supreme talent won through. He studied commercial art at the School of Fine Art in Pittsburgh and hit New York very soon after, in 1949. And Warhol's career was starry from the word go. As soon as he arrived in New York, within a couple of weeks, he had landed his first commissions. And within two years, he was the highest paid commercial artist. At exactly the period of Mad Men, the boom in advertising in the 1960s. So, having arrived there, having made his name in commercial art, he moved in the late 50s into fine art. Why not? The same images, hang them on the gallery wall, they become fine art. In 1962, in August, the news carried the story of Marilyn Monroe's suicide, something that sent shockwaves through the world, how someone so beautiful, so famous, so apparently with everything to live for, should have committed suicide. The next day, he went out and found a stock image, a cheesecake image, from the period of the film Niagara, looking very beautiful, but it was a construct, a construct of a face. He then transformed it into one of the icons of the 20th century by screen print process. And the screen print is Andy Warhol's signature. If he did it on canvas, it was a painting. If he did it on paper, it was a print. If you did lots of them, you had a portfolio of prints. This exhibition shows the portfolios. The technique is all there. The photographic image, and then the not quite fitting colorways over the top. Here, Marilyn, the colors, they have nothing to do with reality. Her face is a kind of coppery color. Her hair is brown, the most famous blonde of the 20th century, with pink eyeshadow, something she never did. And yet, it couldn't be anyone else and it couldn't be anyone else but Warhol. This is a portfolio called 10 Great Jews of the 20th Century. It dates from 1980, so it's late in Warhol's career. At this point, uh, Warhol had made a considerable name for himself as a portraitist. Uh, basically, everyone came to the factory. Everybody milled round Andy, this still small, quiet, non-person at the center of a storm of people. He had Liza Minnelli on speed dial. He would be down at Studio 54 with Debbie Harry. Everybody knew Andy, and Andy would take a Polaroid and do a portrait. Effectively, he became a society portraitist in a period when that wasn't a very common animal. By 1980, I think he was a bit tired of all his celebrities, possibly, and decided he wanted to do some dead people. And the great Jews of the 20th century came out of that idea. By 1980, the printmaking technique that he was using, with the help of a, a man called Rupert Jason Smith, who had set up 
factory additions with Warhol, had become very sophisticated. And these prints are amongst the very best that you can imagine by Warhol. The elements are all there, the photographic base. He's then sometimes almost eradicated the photograph behind it all. So um, Gertrude Stein up there has become almost a ghost of herself. He then uses his drawing. Suddenly you find that Andy Warhol still can draw and he draws the outlines and adds marks that are intended to give vibrancy to the image, to bring it to life. And then he puts bars of colour and squares of colour over the image itself. And if you're looking for the arty term for it, he basically called them arty rectangles. Uh, Warhol always called a spade a spade, and in fact, that's what he does. He puts some arty rectangles over the front and bobs your uncle, you've got a Warhol. These images, however, are incredibly powerful. Franz Kafka, sea of blue up there. Einstein, all brain in black and white. Golda Meir in bright colours. Sarah Bernhardt, almost like a film star at the bottom there. Gershwin, perhaps the most beautiful of them all. Bright, bright colours and an explosion of, of brushwork behind his head as if he's thinking of the music. As, he, as he's standing there. The Marx Brothers at the end. With the Marx Brothers, he's used a famous Warhol technique of multiplying the image, just as he did with countless Marilyns, countless soup cans. Suddenly, the Marx Brothers come multiplied by three in various different colorways. It's a dazzling symphony of color, and it reminds you of one of the great things about Andy Warhol. He was a colorist in an old-fashioned sense, in the same way that Rembrandt or Titian or any of the great masters of the previous centuries were. He was a colorist. He manipulated color and image. Hardly ever better than this. A few years ago, when I visited the Bank of America's headquarters in Charlotte, I saw this exhibition in another museum at that time much bigger museum, lots of white cubes, and the images were given lots of space, a wall to herself in Marilyn's case. And what struck me very forcibly was how decorative these prints were, how utterly beautiful the colours were, and how they shone when you hung them together. And although I was worried about putting Warhol in a small space like Dulwich Picture Gallery has, I was reassured because, oddly, the artist whose name jumped into my head at that moment was completely bonkers. Francois Boucher, from the middle of the 18th century. Boucher was an artist who painted decoratively. He paints icons, images, of people like Madame de Pompadour, the Marilyn of her day. And he paints them in a particular colour scheme. It's not realistic. It's as if they're made out of confectionery. And you hang them in multiples. And I suddenly thought, right, let's think 18th century. Let's think print room. We will pile Warhols high and we'll hang them decoratively. And that's what we've done in this room. We've mixed several uh, portfolios together, the endangered species, the myths, and the Keith Herring uh, images as well hung them together for pure decorative effect, just as you would have done in the 18th century. And of course, that is the basis of the hang at Dulwich Picture Gallery of our old masters. The old masters at Dulwich are hung as they would have been in 1817 when we first opened to the public. Stack them high, make it decorative. How extraordinary that this subversive late 20th century icon, Andy Warhol, can be hung like an 18th century icon, Francis Boucher. How interesting that is. I'm sure he would have loved it. He played many games with icons from the old masters as well as icons from the cinema. There's the Andy Warhol Mona Lisa. There's the Andy Warhol The Scream by Munch. He played those games. We're just playing with him here. One of the great innovations that Andy Warhol brought to the screen printing technique in the 1970s and 80s was to introduce some extraneous elements 
like in this case, diamond dust. It's a particular product that you sprinkle over the uh, image so that it literally sparkles. This is one of the myths series. It's a, the myth portfolio, which includes people like Superman and, and Uncle Sam and the star Greta Garbo. In this case, it's the shadow. The shadow is a famous character in a, in a radio uh, series that Andy used to listen to. And fascinatingly, he's cast himself as the shadow. And what you see is the shadow on the wall. Andy himself is slightly out of focus. You wonder how much of a self-portrait, how aware that is. Andy Warhol seems to have been a shadowy figure, hiding in plain sight in the middle of his tawdry, fabulous factory, surrounded by celebrities all shouting and overacting like fury. There he was at the center, very quiet, just a shadow. Here he is, sparkling with diamond dust. It sums up his life. <laughs>